Hey, welcome back to another episode of HC Daily. We're talking about Samuel, and today we're going to talk about and read about an old guy giving a farewell speech and conceding his power. Yeah, so 1 Samuel chapter 12 is all about that. Samuel is graciously stepping aside, mm. and then he leads the people to remember where he came from. There's a lot of power in that. So that's what we're talking about today on HC Daily. You're listening to another episode of HC Daily, a daily devotional podcast that you can listen to at home or on the go. We believe that you can grow as much as you want to grow spiritually, and this podcast can be a part of your daily growth plan. So, whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify, or your favorite podcast app, we're glad you're here. Now, let's join our hosts, Jeff Forrester and Chris Zarbaugh in the studio. Well, there we go. Yes. It all started. We're in the, on the episode all about Samuel. Yes, and so, so you're going to ask me a personal question. I am going to. My very first question that I can think of right now I is, can't wait. is very exciting because you're a man about the world, right? You've been sure. all over the place. So uh, how many countries have you been to? Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, Costa Rica four times, Haiti four times, Cuba four times. Uh, been to Brazil, been to Egypt, been to Israel, uh, Africa four times. Um, been to, uh, how many countries in Africa? Uh, oh, Tanzania, Kenya. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to pick, uh, I, I, I can't count. You can't count? A I bunch can't of count. them. Been a, bunch. a bunch. Maybe 10, 12. Did I say Egypt yet? Yeah. Oh, uh, no. That's yeah. in Africa. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, three countries in Africa. Wow. Well, yeah. well, have you been to any Asian countries? You been to India? Uh, uh yes. I've yeah, been yeah. to India been too. To India? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah sure okay. have. Cool. See, I've forgotten. So, uh, wow, you've been all over the place then. Very sophisticated person. That's why you're so sophisticated is that because is. you've seen so much of the I'm world. I'm going to drink tea with so my <laughs> pinky up right now. <laughs> so uh, what's your favorite country? It's really coffee. It's what, 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 what's your favorite country that you've been to? Uh, I think it's Africa. It's Kenya. And, uh, you know, I, I, the thing that stands out in my mind, obviously, it's like the people and the ministry and mm -hmm, everything else, mm -hmm, obviously, mm -hmm. head and shoulders above every other memory. But can I share a 10 second? Oh, go quick? ahead. Yeah. So I had to use the restroom and we had actually dr driven above Kapinguria and then we drove for an hour. Then we got out of the car and walked for an hour mm. to a village that had never seen white people. Hard to believe. Right, right. And the middle of the bush doesn't have long, like large trees. It's just a bunch of like tumbleweeds. Right, right. And I had to use the restroom and I said to Pastor Abraham, who was a local, I said, can I go to the restroom? Where is it? And he just sort of motioned like anywhere you want to. Yes. So I walked so far away and I started to go number one. Uh -huh. And I looked over, and about 15 feet away from me was a black mamba. Oh, wow. Who jump about 15 feet. Yeah, yeah, wow. And if they and bite you... And they're fast. Yeah. And if they bite you, then within 30 minutes, you're dead without yeah. any uh, medical attention. Oh, yeah. You're going home in a body bag. Yeah, in a body bag. Mm -hmm. So I look over, and I see it. And I read up before I went there, and I thought, oh, my goodness. And I'm thinking, luckily, I wasn't downwind. Luckily, I wasn't hurting him, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, what, bothering him. So I immediately, like, sort of, like, clench it. Finish. No, I clenched it, okay, and okay. I walked away, then finished somewhere else, and then went back, and I was just scared to death. I was white as a ghost. Walked in, and I said to Abraham, I said, you'll never believe I just saw Black Mamba. And he yeah. looked at me, and he said, oh. He goes, was it like this? And he made motions like a circle. Yeah. And he goes, or was it like this? And he made motions like squiggly, like 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 yeah. uh -huh. slithering. Uh -huh. And I said, oh, it was like this. It was in a circle. And he goes, ah, it's okay. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. He, like, no so, big deal. Yeah. Oh, he was in a circle? You're fine. Yeah. We were in, uh, uh, did, did the people go running out to go find it? Oh, no. No, no nobody even cared. No. They oh, were like, okay. oh, you're fine. Yeah. I was in Kenya. I stepped on a cobra. Uh, it, was a, it, was, it wasn't a very big one, but uh, maybe a foot, foot and a half long. And um, uh, I had seen it just before I stepped on it. We were a bunch of rocks. And um, all the ladies started screaming immediately, and the men began chasing it. And then because it wasn't a very big one, that meant that the big ones were out somewhere mm -hmm. near and they spent the whole rest of the evening hunting for cobras to kill wow. them. Yeah, because they don't like the big, you know, the poisonous ones. So they like the other ones because the other ones, you know, the non-poisonous snakes or the more passive snakes, they want them in because they, they kill all the vermin. You know, they kill the, the rats and the, the mice. Yeah, and all yeah, like yeah. That. So they want them around. They just don't want the ones that, you know, you know kill people. I so. prefer cats for that job. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, you just gave a big sell for, uh, hey, people should travel the world. <laughs> right. Not every place you go is right. dangerous, right? That's right. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> well, good. Hey, I just figure any any story that you live through is worth telling later, right? It just it makes yeah. for interesting as long conversation. As you tell it well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, hey, uh, talking about stories, we're in the life of Samuel, and uh, today we're seeing Samuel kind of step out of the way. He's been in the limelight until this moment. He's been the primary 
civil and religious leader of Israel for since he was a, a young person. Yeah, and so just to be clear, he's not going to disappear after this because mm. he still stays in the limelight, and, and there's a lot more chapters about him. Yeah. However, what he's sort of doing is he's saying, hey, I want you to recognize Saul as the leader, not myself, right. and he's passing on power, Yeah, which is great. He, he, he moved uh, authority, right? Yeah, he kind of moved more into an advisory role and a spiritual leadership role, but he stepped away from the civil responsibilities of being the primary judge and mm. leader of Israel. And that's the kind of speech he gives here. And I just think it's worth looking at this speech because you really get a, a peek at his heart. Yep. And so uh, here we go. We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 12, and uh, we'll just read the whole chapter. It's about 25 verses, and um, we'll just start in verse 1. It said, Then Samuel addressed all Israel, I have done as you asked, and I've given you a king. Your king is now your leader, and I stand before you, an old gray-haired man, and my sons serve you. I've served you as your leader from the time I was a boy to this very day. Now testify against me in the presence of the Lord and before his anointed one, whose ox or donkey have I stolen? Have I ever cheated any of you? Have I ever oppressed you? Have I ever taken a bribe and perverted justice? Tell me, and I'll make right whatever I have done wrong. No, they replied, you have never cheated or oppressed us, and you have never taken even a single bribe. And the Lord and his anointed one are my witnesses today, Samuel declared, that my hands are clean. Yes, he is a witness, they replied. It was the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron, Samuel continued. He brought your ancestors out of the land of Egypt. Now stand here quietly before the Lord as I remind you of all the great things the Lord has done for you and your ancestors. When the Israelites were in Egypt and cried out to the Lord, he sent Moses and Aaron to rescue them from Egypt and to bring them into this land. But the people soon forgot about the Lord their God. So he handed them over to Sisera, the commander of Hazor's army, and also to the Philistines and to the king of Moab who fought against them. Then they cried to the Lord again and confessed, We have sinned by turning away from the Lord and worshipped, worshiping the images of Baal and Ashtoreth. But we will worship you and you alone if you will rescue us from our enemies. Then the Lord sent Gideon, Bedan, Jephthah, and Samuel to save you, and you lived in safety. But when you were afraid of Nahash, the king of Ammon, you came to me and said that you wanted a king to reign over you, even though the Lord your God was already your king. All right, here's the king you've chosen. You asked for him, and the Lord has granted your request. Now, if you fear and worship the Lord and listen to his voice, and if you do not rebel against the Lord's commands, then both you and your king will show you that you recognize the Lord as your God. But if you rebel against the Lord's commands and refuse to listen to him, then his hand will be as heavy upon you as it was upon your ancestors. Now, stand here and see the great thing the Lord is about to do. You know that it does not rain at this time of the year during the wheat harvest. I'll ask the Lord to send thunder and rain today, and then you'll realize how wicked you have been in asking the Lord for a king. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people were terrified of the Lord and of Samuel. Pray to the Lord your God for us, or we will die, they all said to Samuel, for now we have added to our sins by asking for a king. Don't be afraid, Samuel reassured them. You have certainly done wrong, but make sure now that you worship the Lord with all your heart, and do not turn your back on him. Don't go back to worshiping worthless idols that cannot help or rescue you. They're totally useless. The Lord will not abandon his people because that would dishonor his great name. For it has pleased the Lord to make you his very own people. As for me, I will certainly not sin against the Lord by ending my prayers for you. And I will continue to teach you what is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Think of all the wonderful things he has done for you. But if you continue to sin, you and your king will be swept away. Mm. What a speech. It's a great speech. And uh, there's a lot in there. And yeah. if you think about uh, our questions, you know, the first question is, what stands out most in this passage? Yeah. And uh, I don't know about you, but for me, um, I love the fact that uh, Samuel wanted to prove to the people and convince them once and for all, even though they've been told over and over again, that asking for a king was wicked. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, if you don't believe me, I'm going to make a miracle happen. I'm going to pray, and God's going to send a thunderstorm right. to prove. And then it says, and then they realized, oh no, like we have done a wicked thing, right. you know. And, and and so it's interesting because sometimes we hear something, and we we our head says, yeah, that's probably true. It probably was a bad thing. Then we experience consequences, and it becomes really real. All of a sudden, it becomes heavy. We're like, oh no, we've really done this bad thing. Seems like that's sort of the process they went through. And so Samuel sort of did all of that to say now, you know, and then he proved his point. Yeah. I thought that was great. Yeah. I think that that's really kind of the, the most surprising thing. The rest of it's a big speech, and uh, we'll kind of unpack the speech here 
Hey, uh, but can, I, can I read something since we're talking yeah, about yeah, the rain? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So in my Life Application Study Bible, it says about verse number 17, uh, the wheat harvest came near the end of the dry season during the months we know as May and June. Because rain rarely fell during this period, a great thunderstorm was considered a miraculous event. It was not a beneficial miracle, however, because the rain during the wheat harvest could cause damage to the crops and cause them to rot quickly. This unusual occurrence showed God's displeasure with Israel's demand for a king. Hmm. So we, we, we might think, oh, water's good, but in this yeah. case, water bad. Oh, it, it would have created a famine, hmm. right? If, if it kept raining, it would have ruined all that wheat, and then right. it would have created a famine, and they were terrified of what a famine would do to them. Yeah. That's when they realized, okay, we're messing with God and God's plans. Mm-hmm. Hey, when we go God's way, it's the best way. It may not feel like it. It's not the coolest thing. It's not what everybody else is doing, but the consequences of going God's against God's way is going to be that we're going to suffer all kinds of bad things. And this is what's happening with them is they're, they're being faced with the fact they rebelled against God. So he's being really clear here. Now, God participates with them, not that he's endorsing their bad decision, but God's giving them what they're demanding because he said, hey, Samuel, remember in the passage we read before, he said, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So, okay, fine. Give them what they're demanding. And then from that point on, there's good kings and bad kings. And that's true in our lives today as well. But there's good kings and bad kings. And basically, when the people were choosing to honor God, uh, the king would lead them well, and the king would be a good king. And then evil kings would lead the people to be dishonoring God, and then they'd have all this judgment come on them until finally the kingdom fell apart. But um, So uh, what do we learn most about God in this passage? That's the first really big question. What, what do we learn mm-hmm. about God? What do we learn about people? So what did you learn about God in this passage? Well, I mean, God uh, showed himself with the evidence of the storm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then at the same time, God, uh, you know, again, just sort of, solidified through Samuel to the people that as long as you are going to obey me and follow me and honor me, I'll be there for you. Yeah. I'll be there for you. <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, but the, when the rain I'll starts to fall for you and, and that funny, that's actually yeah. the next line. But, uh, but anyway, I would say the thing we learned about God here is that he is consistent. If anything, yeah. he is faithful. Yeah. Uh, you know, his commandments never fail. Uh, the same message that Samuel's giving to the people have been the same messages given by Moses. Yeah. And through all the generations. Well, that's that's what he's demonstrating here is that God always shows up. Mm-hmm. Every time your heart is surrendered to him and you're ready to confess your sin and be completely dependent on him and make him the priority of your life, God always shows up, right? Mm-hmm. God hasn't left us, right? We, we've pushed him away too many times, but when we repent, he says, God always shows up every time mm. and he solves our problems. So, yeah. So uh, what do we learn about people? That, that's the next question. So we always ask, you know, what do we learn about God? And then what do we learn about people? I think the thing that really jumps off the page for me as far as what do we learn about people is how quickly they are to go back to their old habits, right? And we're also learning and the benefit, Samuel is trying to teach them the benefit of remembering where you came from, right? It gets easy to get self-centered in the moment. We get stuck in the moment, and we we just think, man, right now, if I could just have this thing, if if we could just achieve this, if we could just accomplish this, if I could work this thing out, we get obsessed about what's right in front of us, and we forget our past. We forget where we came from. But when you look back, that's when you realize how good God is, and that God always has been, been on my side. God's always delivered me when I was heading in the wrong direction, but I turned back to Him and repented of my sins, and then He would always deliver me. And there's tremendous benefit in in remembering where we came from. Mm. And I don't know that we can stress that enough that uh, it doesn't matter how far you've gone, uh, God hasn't given up on you yet. Mm. Yeah. I, I think for me, the thing that stands out when asking the question, what do you learn about people, is that the people only sort of cried out, uh, oh no, we have done wrong when it affected them. Yeah. And uh, even though they were told in previous passages, and again, you know, you really can't, uh, say for certain that they weren't feeling that way, but it wasn't recorded. And it was recorded here because there was such an outcry of commonality. Everybody, oh no, we have done wrong. It was so you know prominent that it was recorded in the Bible. And yet it only came after the rain. And it just cracks me up sometimes how that is our human tendency even today. Yeah. You know, somebody will tell us something, we'll say, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's probably wise. Yeah, I know that's what God's word says. But then when something affects us directly, we go, oh no. Right. And all of a sudden now that's really important. Right. And which is sort of what I was trying to allude to earlier. And that is people are people, man. We are just 
we're just those creatures. Yeah. It, it, it's like, you know, when it, when it, when it messes our world up, when it, when it affects us, then all of a sudden you grab our attention. Yeah. But you know, when things are going fine, we're going to just be like, Oh, okay. All right. This is in, in recovery. It's about hitting bottom. Mm. There has to be that moment when you finally hit bottom and, and you, you know, um, when Jesus tells the story, I'm cross-referencing here, you're not supposed to do that, but when Jesus tells the story of the um, the lost son, the Bible says he came to his senses, right? When we finally hit bottom, we come to our senses, like in this situation, they come up against, wow, we're risking our harvest. We're risking our families. That's what got their attention. And, you know, we we tend to be miserable in those moments. We think it's the worst moment of our life when we hit bottom or when we're finally confronted with our sin. And in reality, it's the best moment when we finally mm-hmm. wake up because we've been in this fog, we've been uh, believing a lie, and then suddenly God rattles our cage, He wakes us up, we're confronted with our sin, we're confronted with all the dumb decisions we're making and the consequences of those, and it's in that moment that the people then go, we, we repent of our sins. God, whatever it takes, mm-hmm. you know, work in us and change us, and, and that's what they have. I... I that is, I think, one of the great applications in this whole thing. The other one, because the next question that we always ask is, how do I apply this? Because God's Word is real, it is true, how do I leverage this and apply it in my own life? And one of the big questions you would ask is, there's an example to follow. And so that's definitely one of them right there, that idea of following the example of when you do hit the wall, don't be miserable. In that moment, repent, turn to God. And that's the moment when he will give you confidence and reassurance. Because it starts off where Samuel is saying, you should be afraid of God. But then once they're confronted with their sin, then in verse 20, he says, don't be afraid. You've certainly done wrong, but make sure now that you worship the Lord with all your heart. Don't turn your back on him. Don't go back to worshiping idols. And he says, and the Lord will not abandon his people because that would dishonor his own great name. The things God does for you is not just for you, right? Mm. It's, it's that it, it, he's not going to ruin his own name. He's not going to ruin his own reputation, right? It's the two things together. Everything is supposed to be designed to uh, honor and glorify God. So that's one. The other thing that really jumps out to me as far as application is this speech ends 500 years, almost 500 years of the judges providing spiritual and civil leadership representing God, uh, you know, in, in this way, and now switches over to a king, and Samuel does it in such a gracious way. He steps back yeah. and says, you know, I don't have to be the f- main focus of the people of Israel anymore. Yeah, it's and, very uh, gracious. Yeah, in fact, that's where my mind went, actually, when you said uh, the question, is there an example for me to follow? I actually thought of Samuel, mm-hmm. because Samuel actually said, hey, before I go ahead and lay all this out to you, I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. Have I ever taken a bribe? Right. Have I ever been unfaithful? Have I ever tried to rule over you? Right. Have I ever tried to leverage my position, right, to oppress you? Right. So he's asking all these things, and you know what he's really saying? He's saying, does my faithfulness count for something? Right. Because had he taken a bribe, his words would have been useless, mm-hmm. right? So what he's really doing is he's saying, I have lived a life, and he actually describes himself as an old man with gray and white hair. So he's really saying, like, I have aged with you, I have lived, and I have lived a life of faith faithfulness. He says, from the time I was a child, I yes. ruled over you. Yes, That's what yes, he says. yes, yes. Yeah. yeah and, and so just the unbelievable, uh, just uh, in, uh, what am I trying to think of? The word, the bigness. Do you know how, realize how huge that statement is? Oh, yeah. And so I, I think I tell this story, uh, I've told this story more than once, but I'm going to tell it again. And that is when I was at the Promise Keepers and they said, what do you want to be yeah. known for? Yeah. I think I mentioned this months ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And, uh, and I just, at the end, I just said, I want to be known to as a person to be faithful. Yeah. And then Billy Graham came on the screen and, and that was his answer. And I was like, I nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> because, because, uh, you know, it, yeah. it, for me, it's like, that really is it. I want at the end of my life for somebody to say, wow, he was a faithful dad. Yeah. He was a faithful husband. He was a faithful pastor. He was a faithful Christian. And that speaks volumes. And that's what Samuel's doing. And yeah. he's prefacing his whole speech. He's saying this, this life of faithfulness yeah. gives credibility to what I'm about to tell you. I've only ever been faithful since I was a child. Mm. God's allowed me to lead you. You've demanded a king. This was wrong. It was wicked for you to do it. But God's going to work in it anyways. And then I love in verse 23, he says, um, I will certainly not sin against the Lord by ending my prayers for you, and I'll continue to teach you what is good and right. Mm. He doesn't give up on him. 
Right. What a good leader. Yeah. Hey, listen, I don't have to get all the credit, but I'm not going to give up on you. Mm. Right. I'm going to keep teaching you. I'm going to keep guiding you. I'm going to keep praying for you. And, you know, because he wasn't abdicating his spiritual authority. He was just conceding his civil authority. Mm. And he said, I'm still going to lead you. I'm, I still love you. I still believe in you. And if you follow God's ways, you can have a good life. You know, uh, I know I know it's not a necessarily a great thing to point out the, the fallibility of preachers, right, who fall. Oh, right? sure. It's never a fun topic. Uh, but if you think about all the judges that we've talked about, oh, yeah. Samuel stands head and shoulders in terms of faithfulness above those people. Yep. And so it's, it's one of those things where you can hear stories. And by the way, my guess is almost every listener has probably either you know, been a part of or has heard of or knows somebody that's been impacted by the fallibility and the fall of some sort of a leader in the church. And, and, and those are such, dra- it's such a drag to talk about. Right. But for every, you know, several people that you hear those stories, to look, to find one person yeah. who's faithful. And by the way, there's way more than we think. Sure, Cause, absolutely. Because they don't make the front page. Right, they're not making it on the news. Right, right, right. right. So, so I think of this, and I think of, man, look to the Samuels of the world. Mm-hmm. Look to the Samuels of the world to say, man, it's possible. Yeah. And, and part of it is because, you know, we, we kind of saw that, you know, sometimes we're, um, you know, raised in an environment that lends itself to that. Sometimes, you know, like even Saul here, you know, even yeah. we give, we're given a little bit of insight about Saul's background. Which says like, yeah, it was sort of his upbringing where he didn't even know who Samuel was, <laughs> right. you know, which sort of he sort of kept down that path his whole life, and yet here's Samuel who's just raised in the right environment. He's faithful through and through. You know the face. You know when when a famous preacher falls, you know him because he sought the headlines. Right. Right. Now he may might have been seeking the headlines for the sake of good, and then winds up turning, making bad decisions, but. W- what you see is a guy like Samuel's not ever seeking the headlines. Hmm. He's not trying to get out in front of everybody. No. He's just doing his job. He's doing the right thing. And then he says, you tell me, have I ever cheated you? Have I ever done wrong? And yeah. the people are no, before God. God is our witness. You've never mistreated us. And I agree with you. I think there's millions, have been millions of pastors and religious leaders around the world that that can be their story. That's right. They just didn't have the headlines from the beginning. Right? That's right. And, well, uh, I've never made yeah. national news. I haven't yet either. I yeah. Think. So, and I pray that if we do, it's for something great. <laughs> something good. That's right. Something <laughs> great. Well, hey, listen, join good. us next time as we continue on with the story of Samuel. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help us spread the word by liking this episode and sharing it on your social media platforms. Be sure to leave a comment and review, and don't forget to give us five stars. When you do, you help us reach even more people who need a daily devotional like HC Daily. If you'd like to hear more from Chris and Jeff, they're both teaching pastors at Heritage Church, located in Southeast Michigan. You can get more of their messages by clicking on the Messages tab at heritagechurch.com. Be sure to join us again soon for another episode of HC Daily.